In this video, we'll go over a five-step process I like to use to solve linear algebra problems in MATLAB. This is a pretty short video. We'll just discuss the process. The next few videos will do examples to illustrate this process. The process of solving a linear algebra problem can be distilled into five steps. First, before doing any math or writing, you need to look at the system from above. That is, you need to understand what kind of system you're solving. Then, you can form the equations describing the system. Afterwards, you arrange the equations you generated in AX equals B form, then solve. The last step involves checking your answer. You first need to analyze the system holistically. It's important to know what kind of system you're solving. If you're solving a thermodynamics problem, you might need to recall some of the important thermo equations. Knowing what you're solving before you do anything is critical. In step two, you apply the relevant first principles to derive the equations governing the system's behavior. I understand that this is a sophomore level course and you haven't had much exposure to different classes of problems, so we might give you the equations in the problem statement. But for some simple systems, like a basic circuit or a basic physics problem, we might make you draw a free body diagram and whatnot. Anyways, this table contains some of the equations you might encounter and find useful when solving different types of linear algebra problems. For physics-based problems, you'll likely use Newton's second law. For systems involving springs which stretch and deform, you'll probably use Hooke's law. In circuits problems, you'll definitely want to use a combination of KVL, KCL, and Ohm's law. If you need to solve a problem involving a circuit-based representation of a thermodynamics or heat transfer problem, then you can use the thermal equivalent of Ohm's law. An example of this is given in Chapter 5 of the Vic textbook. In step three, you arrange the equations from step two into AX equals B form. The trick here is to be neat and work slowly. This is probably the part that is the most error prone. When you order the equations, be consistent. Put all the variables in the same order for all of the equations you have. Sometimes some of the coefficients are either zero or one. In my opinion, I think it's very helpful to actually write in 0 and 1 so you preserve the matrix looking structure that results from ordering the equations. Here I have three unordered equations. Here's how I would order them. First, I would make sure that each equation lists x1 first, then x2, and finally x3. That's what I did for the first equation up here at the top. I see that the second equation doesn't have an x1 term, but I write in 0x1 anyways to maintain consistency. I also write 1x2 and 1x3 for the same reason. In the last equation, there's no x2. We also have a minus 2 term on the left, which I'm going to move over to the right hand side so that the left hand side of all my equations only contains coefficients. As before, I write 2x1 first, then 0x2 next and then finally, the negative 6x3. This makes forming a, x, and b really easy. Now that we have a, b, and x, we can solve it by hand or in MATLAB. If you like Gauss-Jordan elimination, you can invoke the RREF function. I personally prefer to use the backslash operator. MATLAB formally calls the backslash operator ML divide, but nobody really uses the ML divide function itself. They just use the backslash as a shortcut. Once you type the A matrix and B vectors into MATLAB, all you do is issue X equals A backslash B, and it'll give you the X vector. That's actually it. I also computed the row reduced form of the augmented matrix, and you can see that we obtained the same results. Before we move on, I'd like to explain the backslash operator a bit more. When the backslash operator is invoked, MATLAB actually does a lot behind the scenes depending on the size and structure of the A matrix. This flowchart comes directly from the MATLAB documentation. As you can see, it's pretty complicated. The various algorithms, decompositions, and whatnot MATLAB does behind the scenes is beyond the scope of the course, but the main takeaway is that the backslash operator is a flexible solver, not one single operation. Although we aren't yet learning least squares regression, I want to make you aware that the backslash operator can do that as well. The last step is to check your answers using some test cases. One test case you can always rely on is the zero case. In the zero case, you make the entire B vector the zero vector. Since the B vector represents an external agent acting on the system, there shouldn't be any change in the response if you don't disturb the system. You should also perform parameter studies to see if there are any patterns that arise in the response. For example, if you're solving a simple circuit problem, 
it would probably make sense to observe an increase in the current as you increase the voltage you apply because of Ohm's law. If you don't notice that trend, it could indicate that something is wrong. To summarize, the five-step process is useful for solving linear algebra problems. In this course, you probably don't have to worry too much about step two, but I'm leaving it in for your future courses. Also in this course, we won't be solving too many problems by hand, especially once the A matrices you encounter become very large. Instead, the backslash operator can solve large systems with ease. I realize this video is pretty abstract, so in the next few videos we'll do examples so that you can see this process being applied to problems. See you next time.